have the honor of moderating our first panel this evening. Um, and I want to start with this line from a recent Wired article about the success of the OWN network, um, which really struck me. Start here with an image, alter one, then another, and then another, color them with truth, frame by frame, and do not stop. That is how revolution begins in television. We all understand the power of representation, that's why we're all here tonight. Um, but I want to discuss it with two leading ladies who have made a lasting impact in inclusivity in Hollywood, advertising and beyond. They are shaping the conversations about representation and perception that need to happen in 2018. So everyone, show your love for screenwriter and producer of our favorite shows ever, <laughs> including Girlfriends, Being Mary Jane, <laughs> and Love Is, Mara Brock Akeel, and the president of Wyden and Kennedy, the amazing Colleen DeCourcy. And we'll rise up, I like the waves, we'll rise up, in spite of the ache, we'll rise up, and we'll do it a thousand times again. Okay, okay I gotta figure out how to sit this time. Okay. Oh, funny. oh my god. Yes. Can we give a round of applause for the fashion? <laughs> what a great audience! Isn't it? Wow. Just feel it's the just energy. Like Look at this beautiful audience. Exciting. Take it in. Take it in. I am taking it in. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> so, I told Colleen to give me a sign if I like just start to gaze off because I'm fangirling. Um, but I want to start off with the theme of our weekend, which is the moment of truth. Um, and I'd like to know about a moment of truth. You know, each of you have had in your own journey, in your work, which it truly does show up in your work, um, as leading ladies um, in your respective industry. So Mara, let's start with you. That, that moment of truth, or what moment of truth did you have that affected your leadership style, and honestly, your path? It's, my moment of truth was um, between the second and third season of Girlfriends. When I... <laughs> Okay, wait, I'm it's a, it's a very, if I well up on this story, I, you're going to get me crying off the bat. Already, I'm going to I was going to say, I think I I'm already. Like, yeah. I was like, oh my God. So what happened was, when it was, when I conceived Girlfriends, I had not ever run a show before. Mm -hmm. Showrunner, the boss, handling this, you know, essentially $25 million worth of television. I have never done that before, oh. so I needed to be supervised. Mm -hmm. So the deal to me was, okay, if I'm going to be supervised, so in a year or two, they will train me to, to be able to build that confidence for me to be the showrunner, and then season three, I will take over my show. Yeah. Well, at the time when this was happening, the studio, um, Paramount at the time, and um, Kelsey Grammer, who was, is, is the executive producer more in name and more than anything, mm -hmm. So at the time, everybody was like, well, Mara, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Who, broke for whom? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is just very transparent. Remember two years ago I said, and this is what we thought, <laughs> and even my supervising producers, they were in on it. Everybody knows this. And they just didn't want me mm. to move forward. Mm. And there's that moment where you realize, I, I mean, I'm all in, passionate, and... I remember sitting in the office, and then you have representatives, mm -hmm. and my representatives were not representing me. Mm. And, and oh. <laughs> mm. Wait, should we practice that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so here I, I think I'm, I'm like 31 in this story, 31 in this story. I've never been, I'm at the head of this studio. They're like, well, go talk to the head of the studio about your job, about this moment. And I think they were, everybody would plan it. They would, they would placate me. Mm -hmm. You know, they talked to my reps, but then they got nowhere. So then I had to go fight for myself. And I just thought it was so unfair. I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. Cut to the meeting. The meeting is going horribly for me mm -hmm. to the point where literally I remember the cotton mouth. Oh, I remember yes. I'm losing. Mm. And I remember... And he asked me a question, and he said, well, who's the better writer? 
I was like, are we here? It, it was just like one of those out of body experiences. And I remember this, so I'll get, I'm gonna share this. I paused, I closed my eyes in the middle of the meeting and said a five second prayer. I opened my eyes and I said, I don't know who the better writer is, but I know if you don't have me on this show, it will fail. <laughs> and these are my terms. They sent me over to talk to Kelsey. I'm sitting across from him. He's eating a sandwich before Frasier. And I was like, <laughs> and I just remember having, I remember the experience of being, uh, the awareness of my body in context to their physical posturing, this mm. idea that they had about me. Mm. And it was really this moment where I decided, no, it's the idea that I have about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, Girlfriends went on. <laughs> With <me>. um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge the church that's happening up here. <laughs> and the unison. I mean, I need hand waves. You, feel free to let it out. We need some tambourines. Uh, no <laughs> So there were a lot of points that Mara made, but I think Colleen, um, you have similar stories, truthfully, in, in this industry we call we advertising. All do. I know you've had many, many, we but what do. was a recent moment of truth for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's funny. We have, um, I have gone through uh, working in an industry where um, it, 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 I always felt lucky to be mm. there. And it, it didn't dawn on me uh, for quite a long time um, that I was in the position that I was in because basically I was um, as close as you could get uh, to being a white man in the business. I was one step to the left and one step behind and therefore something that you could let in and not kind of rock the boat mm -hmm. too much. Um, and you go through your career and there are different things that kind of happen that, that slowly start to make that hit for you, but you know recently um, it was uh, Naomi Wadler, actually, when she stood up at the, the March for Our Lives. And um, this young girl stood up and she said, you know, I am here to represent the young African-American girls mm -hmm. whose stories are never told on national television. Mm -hmm. And this um, cold shock uh, went through me. It makes me feel like I'm now. Mm. Uh, and to watch this young woman land this statement with an amount of aplomb and truth that you couldn't look away from. Um, and I kind of took that very seriously and I looked at, at our own business because we are creators of stories. We are creators of media. We tell stories that dictate how people see the world and um, sat and whipped out my laptop and kind of wrote this somewhat angry screed, basically, <laughs> um, to the ECDs of our company, who run all the offices, um, that uh, started from, um, you know, is it really true uh, that uh, uh, there are no books that are as good as yours? And, and could it be that you can't find any people to fill these roles with because your recruiters know what you like and in doing so wanting to please you, mm -hmm. you know, only bring forward candidates that will be acceptable to you? Um, have you forgotten your own sort of humble brag creation story about, you know, insert name of genius here, mm -hmm. uh, that you had a, a shitty book but somebody gave you a, a chance and have you become so promoted and so blind that you cannot see that someone took you and fixed your shit. You know? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and often. And uh, uh, it, was, it was amazing because um, uh, Blake, who I saw when I came in and sat down, who runs one of our offices, I'd just gotten off a plane with this, I was full of fire. Uh, and um, he, I was jet lagged and he said, do you want to stand up and the office wants to hear from you. And I was like, well, actually, I have a thing. <laughs> <laughs> a little ditty that I wrote. <laughs> I have a thing. And um, basically ending on, you know, the solution to this problem will not be found in a brief or a boardroom. And like the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, it will show up. And it will not give any fucks about the feelings of you or I. And um, Blake and the, and the men that ran that office, I get her. 
<laughs> they, uh, they stood and nodded, and there was this moment where they knew what my leadership was about to them. The office knew what my expectation was of them. And um, I was very grateful. And then we went on to kind of repeat that. And I just thought, well, we can make a difference here. Yeah. You know, well, we can on behalf this. of everyone who will come after into your company in this industry, um, for both of you, thank you. Because your moments of truth are the reason why you're here. Um, so thank you. So representation is something um, that is really important. You'll hear it time and time again this weekend. Um, but it often gets overlooked. People say it, and they don't mean it. Um, Mara, you've done more than almost anyone to represent the black female experience on television. Oh, wow. um, Thank you. Really, truly. Um, from Joan <laughs> to Tasha Mack. Yes. <laughs> we all have a little bit of Tasha Mack in us. <laughs> to Mary Jane. And now Nuri on Love Is. <laughs> How has your experience in creating and sharing complicated, you know, female characters changed since, since you started um, and you've grown? And how are these characters being received um, by the studios and networks you pitch to? You know, it's very interesting. Part of the success of Girlfriends has been because the show was undervalued. They saw it as filler, they saw it as inexpensive programming that felt a need and maybe we could program it behind the Parkers that had some success. But I don't think they ever valued it. And by virtue of that, I can tell you they, they didn't, they didn't. And so you could sort of receive that and be very upset about that. And I've had my moments, but I decided, okay, let me pivot. Let me sit, st I have, I do have something. I don't have, you know, all the paints in the, you know, th that are offered. The canvas is not as big. Okay, but I do have this, and what can I do with this? And mm -hmm. so, one of my blessings, so the thing that felt very, uh, as a big, sort of like, the adversity of that, mm -hmm. was one of my biggest assets that I was, so because you're undervalued, they don't, they don't look too closely. Now, I've had my fight. Can you say that again? Because I think this audience yeah. understands. <laughs> when you're undervalued, they sometimes don't look so close. I mean, you, you hit the markers. I had yeah. to hit, you know, I yeah. had to turn the episode on time. It had to be yeah. good. I certainly had to deal with notes and things like that. That's a given in television. Get past the given. Ultimately, they were spending no marketing dollars trying to promote it to be a hit. But I knew my audience got it and I knew I valued it. I knew the team, the village. So it was really important for me to make sure that we, the village making it, that we valued it. Mm -hmm. So we treated it like it was, a, I treated it like it was a hit show. Because mm. it is a hit show, yeah. by the way. But, it, but no, it wasn't <laughs> valued at that. Even from my, even initially, even with my own audience, it mm -hmm. was not valued. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of its, the biggest blessings because while you weren't looking, I was able to actually put complex characters that were, today I am constantly overwhelmed with the love that I still get over girlfriends. And when I think about it, girlfriends, I got it in the bottle. That mm -hmm. bottle exists and it will show up on anybody's shore at any time and it's continued to hit generation after generation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's global and it's brand new. No one will measure this for me, but I know it. Mm -hmm. I have my own sort of measurement. But the point I'm trying to make is Joan, Tony, Maya, Lynn, even William, um, all, of those, <laughs> all of those characters like are fully realized. <laughs> And I got to do it again with Tasha, Melanie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 I was gonna say Brittany, but that's not my character's name. Um, uh, I'm blanking. I got to do it again with, and then I got to keep, I, I got to stay at it. So mm -hmm. what happened, what you're watching is me getting better at my craft. Mm -hmm. So Nuri, and what I'm very proud of with that is, when you watch Love Is, first of all, I directed, after all these years, I finally sat in the director's chair. So Amen. I directed, um, and that's because you're not encouraged to direct after I was helping many directors and also learned from my husband who sat next to me. My point is, when you watch the show, 
Nuri and the show Love Is in general is what I had in my mind when I first got to Hollywood off the boat. That's what was in my mind, and, but in reality, I could not produce it then. I didn't have enough skill set. I didn't know enough. I didn't know, have enough experience. So Love Is now is how I've always seen us. So in a way, I feel like I'm just beginning. Wow. You're just meeting me, but the evolution of the characters mm -hmm. I've been able to give fully formed characters from the beginning that continue to have a life. One starting from an undervalued situation and now a valued situation mm -hmm. so that now I have the tools also, yeah. the resources to create that sort of character. So I think, um, and so when you, and so one of the biggest differences is the context in the character. Girlfriends was technically a multi-camera show mm -hmm. that we, I pushed the envelope as much as I could to make it more, you know, single camera-ish. But Love Is is a actual single camera show that the body, I make sure that our bodies are in context. We don't always have to deliver the joke to the, to the camera, tight shot. You know, I get to show their hands. I get to show their ears, their neck, these other beautiful details of us and our humanity mm -hmm. um, are fully more re form because I now have value. Absolutely. Does that make sense? No, it yeah. totally <laughs> makes sense. And just to add to that, I feel, you know, when they talk about sort of Beyonce's evolution, yes, I'm comparing you to Beyonce. That applies to you Thank too. you. <laughs> How you look at her evolution as, uh, you're welcome. Um, her evolution as a performer, you know, now she gets to do Beychella, but could she have done that when she yeah. was with Destiny's Child? Probably not. So right. she evolved and now gives us so much culture changing yes. um, events, earth shattering, world shut down moments. Um, but she <laughs> had to evolve to that, as yes. you explained with um, yourself. Um, Colleen, I, I'm going to stick with you for a little bit because there's a lot to unpack. So oh, no. um, <laughs> get ready. Be but, very careful when you open my Pandora's okay. box. <laughs> <laughs> so not that question. OK, just kidding. Okay. Colleen, what kind of responsibility do you think, um, and you touched upon it a little bit with the studio and network heads, um, that power players in media um, and the creative industries have right now, um, what changes are you making at your agency to kind of shoulder and express that responsibility? I think with your moment of truth, you, you touched upon it a little bit, yeah. but more directly, what do sure. you think? Sure. I mean, you know, you can, you can look at what's wrong with the system and start to begin to fix it. Mm -hmm. You can me too, you can times up, you can fire offenders, you can do all kinds of things. But actually the, the, the river that runs through it is culture. So you know, Toni Morrison always said, if no one's telling your story, you have to tell it yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that our responsibility is to elevate and get as many of these stories that were not of that gaze out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's um, the voice of a woman, whether it's the voice of a man of color, whether it's voice of LGBTQ, these stories are not considered norm strictly because the airtime they are given is so small that it does not represent. So really, on top of my job being to create a safe environment where people can have a respectful workplace and that they can do their best, it's to elevate and get as many of these stories out into the world mm -hmm. because nobody needs another one of the other stories. And we're really just trying to do that as much and as often as possible, honestly. Thank you. Um, OK, so we're going to get a little bit, a little testy, a little spicy. Uh-oh. <laughs> <coughs> So there's, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now, and you, you hit upon it in terms of Me Too and Time's Up, mm -hmm. um, about how men should act, how they should respond. <laughs> oh, um, can they come back to work? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> what is, <laughs> um, and particularly at this yeah. time in our culture, and even, even today, there was a huge hashtag that went around yeah. why I didn't report. Um, and if you haven't caught up on that, please do. Um, so how can art, um, and certainly, um, advertising and what we do um, help us process these issues and elevate the conversation beyond you know going a little bit higher so they go low we go higher um, so how does art help us do that yeah I mean there's a, a couple of things packed into that you know and I'm just gonna quickly because I think they all do land on that art question um, the first thing you know we we hear a lot about um, even a criminal goes to jail does their time, 
comes back out, gets to start again. Um, first response to that is always, okay, well, where's the jail? Where's the time? Mm -hmm. um, then you get to the second thing of, uh, we already have so many voices of a singular kind that if you have made a mistake like that and there are, you know, people lined up behind you dying to get the opportunity to express themselves, then I'm sorry, it's next up. And that's just kind of the way that has to go, coming back a second time. The first time was a damn privilege. Yeah. The second time is just unthinkable, yeah. and there are people that get no time at this point. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, art's ability to address this is that what we were really hearing right now is, is the purest form of politics which is the rationalization of who knew what, when, and did, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that um, it's very easy to get caught up in that, and art has always been the thing that allows us to speak an incredibly clear, fine, and disturbing truth and have it put out into the world. So if politics is failing us, then art has to be the thing mm -hmm. that steps up and continues that voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I know one of the things that is not in the conversation just yet, and, hmm. and so as an artist, mm -hmm. I decide to be very vulnerable mm -hmm. um, for both me and my husband actually decided to be both very vulnerable and share a truth through our television show, Love Is. Mm -hmm. So the characters of Nuri and Yasir have, they announced that they've both been um, molested as children. Mm. And it was interesting. So one of the things that I thought I wanted to do was talk about the Me Too's when you're three, four, or even younger, <laughs> uh, horribly, when you're the Me Too before you even get to the workplace. Yeah. And the survivor, and what I realized, and I knew, to your point, art has the power Storytelling is one of the most, it goes back to, you know, the time, I guess, when, they, when fire came around and you sat around something to talk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing it forever. Yeah. And it, what it does is it, it, it creates a bond. Mm -hmm. It creates, um, oh, man, me too. Yeah. I, I experienced that too, whatever the story may be, yeah. or the idea of what could possibly happen. But what I realized by putting that on the air, mm -hmm. by giving that voice, the amount of uh, tweets, Instagram messages, direct emails, text of people saying, thank you, allowing me to say and, and give public voice, to give voice to something that happened to them, to release it, mm -hmm. to get past it, to heal it. I don't know if you're ever, it'll be a part of you, it'll always be a part of you, mm -hmm. but to let go of that weight, yeah. to maybe ca catch on to the rest of your life, of your own spirit, your own spirit and your own humanity was my answer to your point about yeah. where art has to step in, where politics are failing us, um, governance is failing us, the debate on whether my, my or women are worthy of being listened to or believed. Yeah. While you're debating that, maybe if we can start healing or letting people just release the wound, yeah. that perhaps we would find a way to talk about it or that a character might see, someone may see a character do it on TV and that seems normal. That may empower someone to speak up Absolutely. so that the abuse doesn't continue for longer. And whatever, whatever way it can help, mm -hmm. um, I think t sharing that story or trying to do it in a way that can connect to the audience for their own self-healing mm -hmm. while we figure out all this politic part mm -hmm. and maybe in meeting the middle Absolutely. to take bigger change, bigger change. Well, thank you. Yeah, so on that, you talk about healing and meeting in the middle. I think as a society, you know, there was an ad that came out a couple of weeks ago, or even maybe more like a month ago, um, that seemed to heal us in an instant, and it also, also seemed <laughs> to break the internet. And that was the Nike ad. The internet ad. was so broken already. <laughs> <laughs> And that was the Nike ad with Colin Kaepernick, courtesy of Weidman Kennedy. Yeah. The people were here. 
That was good. That was, it take this one in. <laughs> I think everyone is incredibly proud of that, uh, that team and um, that work. So do you, uh, Colleen, want to talk about sort of the impact on that and, you know, don't necessarily have to talk about the, the process or the hot sauce and I, that's just a shout out to the hot sauce in our swag bag because <laughs> it was literally hot sauce. Um, <laughs> But talk about sort of the impact of that ad um, on Wyden and Kennedy and, um, to be honest, the world at this point. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, it, I think that ad is a culmination of a very long road um, for the brand and for Wyden and Kennedy in that um, there are two sort of hallmarks that have always been present in, in the work that um, those two companies have done together. And one of them is um, truth, mm -hmm. not advertising. Uh, and the, the other one is about the voice of the athlete. And I feel like I'm really just keep hitting on this same note, but I just don't think you can hit it enough, which is that, that point of view, uh, being true to giving the athlete a platform in which to say the thing that matters to them. And that has been around for a long time at Nike. I think, um, you know, from Hello World, <laughs> you know, all the way through um, to, to um, you dream crazy enough, mm -hmm. um, Serena having just a fucking heartbreaking mm -hmm. week at the same time as, as Colin is watching himself vindicated. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was, it was really hard to watch as well. But I think when you have the simplicity of something like that, all the marketing goes away, all the advertising falls away, the need for production even, I mean, uh, with no distraction from the spots. For me, that idea rang true and clear with the picture of Colin's face and the copy. The tweet did everything that had to be done, and that, to me, is um, why that mattered so much. We got out of the way. Um, it's a bit of a Robin Hood act, you know, you still, from the rich and give to the poor, and I don't think Colin's poor, but I think the percentage of voice yes. that goes to that issue, and his voice in particular, so much noise around this one topic, mm -hmm. and um, But also, it's the crazy. standing with him. Yes. The kneeling yes. with him, in a sense, you know, that mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes to walk it alone, but when somebody stands next to you, and sort of yes. Eric Reed has been there as well, and many other, but, you know, yeah. a powerhouse that's right. like that. Yeah. I mean, that that's a game changer. It is, it because in that moment, you took it away from the people who had the most to lose from it, mm -hmm. yeah. which you did, and the athletes that chose to take a knee out into the mm -hmm. mass public. Yeah. It becomes very hard to contain. What is very nice to see is that it was um, moments in, in a row where, you know, Ford tweets their support, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, uh, the NFL says, yeah, they should be allowed to. I mean, they, these are big, massive moments that, that he, he, he couldn't do alone. Nobody can do alone. Right. So I think that's... that's For a long time he did. It was nice that it steps up. It me it's meaningful. And I think that's where even where the consumer is. I think there's what I do love about you know, so much has been made of the millennials. But what I mm. value so much about this generation is how much... And I don't know if they're always going to benefit from the change that they've been making, mm. but they it entered into, no, my dollar, my time means yeah. something. Yes. And I've been given the internet to access all this information, yes. and I'm, what am I going to do with this information? Well, I'm trying to reach a truth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying, and what's true to me, and what brand, so I have some power. It may only be however much money a sneaker costs. Um, but where do I want to spend that? Yeah. And I think that is also important. So I think even the people, I would imagine, has also entered in, the consumer has entered into the conversation oh, with yeah. Nike to be like, we're, and, but that's a beautiful, it's, and that's okay. It's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. everybody's standing together. And um, anyway, it's a beautiful that, moment. That, and, I, and I just, and I even told my kid recently, <laughs> I was like, are you dreaming crazy enough? <laughs> so, Amy, it's already entered into the kitchen discussion, so thank you. It is amazing that that battle was very uh, much writ large in, in kind of um, a two-day thing, which is um, the street, you know, the stock. Yeah. Oh, yes. The, the old guard of yeah. what matters and what rules drops three points 
and within 24 hours of the sales, <laughs> yes. which is the people, goes up 30. Yes. And it was just like, And then 47, wins? right? The next day <laughs> yeah. or something like that? Yeah, it's just, it's a really nice, nice transfer of power. Yeah. So um, you mentioned something that goes into sort of a question that I have for you, which is people may not benefit from the change they make. Mm. Um, and so recently there's been like a big conversation about, you know, female fury. And I know there's a lot, you know, made about it right now, including uh, Serena Williams' reaction at the U.S. Open um, and all the different responses to it and think pieces. Um, so Mara, how do we express anger? Because certainly through your characters, you've made them very complicated where they can be angry and they can um, be sad and they can, it's, they can be complicated. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do we express anger without being billed? And this is for the young professionals who are coming up who are very passionate, um, just in general. This is a very creative industry. Um, without being billed as sort of the angry black man or the angry black woman? Well, they're going to be named the angry black man, the angry black woman. Mm -hmm. I think for me, as an artist, I wanted, to, I wanted to go toe to toe with that. I started with being Mary Jane, more specifically. I mean, Maya's been there, Tasha's been there, but I went head to head with it, with Mary Jane, and that, it's funny, yes, and, and accept, like, okay, this is the label you want to put on me, so let's examine why I'm angry. So I, I'm going to give a shout out to Medill, and that, that journalism part of me is that's, that's the question we have to the most answer, and that is why. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the chipping away of why. I want you to understand why I'm angry. So I think as artists, I know, let's get into their, what is that anger about? What does it look like? And then you can see it supported as you sort of go out there, I remember right after, I remember there was a line I did in the first season of Beamer Jane, and I'm not saying they were, I'm not saying one caused the other, I'm just saying it just happened like this. So Mary Jane goes on a riff about why she's angry and why she deserves to be angry. And the next thing I know, Solange has this amazing album that's also talking about why she's angry and why we have the right to be angry. Mm -hmm. And so there's this conversation, then there's journalists trying to, trying to put that in context. Mm -hmm. You know, Angela Rye, she'd be going every night. <laughs> just like, huh? And not that she's angry, then you start to see passion and this, and not, just, not that, you, you, she's backing it up with facts yes. and policy and this, and, and it's just, yes, and just owning the space. I'm ang so I'm saying, if the label, then it's time to own the space of our humanity of why we are angry. Yeah. And if you get to why we are angry, sometimes it goes to because I know I'm talented. Mm. I know I'm deserving. Right. I know I can benefit your company greatly, and I just can't get a shot. Mm. You know, um, I, my parents killed themselves, basically, to send me to college, to pit me here, and, and it was supposed to promise me something. I can't even get a, you know, a swing at the, at the bat. Mm. And, and more recently, I've decided to to, to deal with that with the Yasir character, mm -hmm. um, to make space for this anger, to air some of it out, to air some of it out in a way that can get to the story of why. Mm -hmm. And even like, as much as the Colin Kaepernick has been reported on, they, it, it's not that you can report the truth over and over and over again, it's who's going to accept what. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing is, it's created if you focus on the people who still don't understand it's for, you know, it's for police brutality and injustice, so many other people do know what it's about. Mm -hmm. And that understanding is happening for those people who want to have understanding. And that's, that's where the mind shift change is gonna happen. There's some people you're, you're, you're not gonna get. And part of that fight is, in some ways, is this label, okay, if we're gonna talk about me being angry, then if you wanna label me angry, then let's talk about why I'm gonna be angry mm -hmm. and take up that space for your humanity um, and be relentless about it. Amen, hello. <laughs> right. So, so Colleen, um, talking about angry, <laughs> you wrote a pretty incredible piece about women in advertising back in 2012 for Digiday called Confessions of an Ad Exec. Ooh, that sounds good. Yep, yeah. it was anonymous. I don't think it was what they thought they were getting. Oh, <laughs> it was anonymous, but you outed yourself when the editors cut some of the most offensive things male execs said to you. How have things changed or haven't they in the last six years and especially in the last year? Well, 
um, you know, that, that piece was a real moment of truth for me. Um, uh, I honestly don't think that I was even expecting to give them the piece that I did. Uh, and um, I was late delivering it. I had very little time. I was on a bus. <laughs> and um, I had to get it out. And it was one writing top to bottom. And when I reread it and realized how I felt about this issue, I was shocked. Um, and I sent it in. Um, and um, I, I decided to come out and use my name and not the other person's because I thought the other person was just a symbol of a systemic problem. Uh, mm. And um, I believed that if I could own that, I could show other young women in the industry that you could speak out and still hold your job. Um, I would say that for two years after that, I struggled. I paid school bills on credit cards. Um, uh, I did not hear a peep from most of the women like me. Um, I got over 700 emails from men and women of color, mm. um, from people who said, um, uh, I understand uh, what it's like to um, be forced into trying to be something. Uh, what I think uh, now, um, often when I look at it, you know, I left, I just left. Uh, I didn't want to, um, I had a lawyer who knew uh, the person, and um, by the time I got back to the office, uh, I didn't know they were golf buddies, and by the time I got back to the office, uh, he was standing in my doorway and said, are you going to come after me, princess? Um, and um, I was like, no, I'm just, I quit. Uh, today, um, no, it was really, it was, it was not a heroic act. Um, I literally couldn't take it anymore. Uh, uh, today, though, when I look at it, I don't, A, um, clearly I could go after someone. Um, but B, the thing that I hope that we can do with all the, the things that we're trying to bring to the fore, whether it's with Times Up Advertising or, or just the support we're all giving each other, is that before you ever get to that stage, there is an understanding um, that I am empowered to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an understanding that someone will speak. There is an understanding that you will be the one to lose your job. And I think that in this short period of time, that, now the unfortunate thing is that harassment is the sharp tip of that spear. We are not there yet with just basic bias, uh, choking out of opportunity, mm. lack of representation. Nobody is losing their job over those things today. Mm. Um, and I think that that is the place we have not gone. Yeah. Uh, and I'm embarrassed about that. Yeah. I will take whatever steps come in the order they come in. But I just, will, I, I believe we are closer. Thank you. So, um, I hate to say it, we're going to wrap up, but we have a couple more questions. I know we could be here all night, and we will be. Um, <laughs> I just want to hear more from Mara. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have, so these are, this, is, this, is, this final question is one um, which I'm sure you're asked a lot, um, but certainly you've answered it in ways throughout the questions we've asked tonight. But, um, you know, Mara, what do you hope your legacy will be? I mean, obviously a lot of your legacy is in TV and in our lives and in our minds and the way that we walk with our chest out at work and how we talk to our friends and how we gather as girlfriends. and. You know, I can talk about your legacy and what it means to me, mm -hmm. um, but certainly, what do you think your legacy will be? It's funny, that it seems like a, I'd have the ready answer for that question. I think, what do I want my legacy to be? I want my legacy to be that she tried to paint or write um, as many portraits of our humanity as possible so that it has empowered people to be closer to who they are here to be. Yes. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it was the truth. <laughs> that could have been an ad. It really <laughs> I think it will be now that I know you. We need to talk. Like in the back. <laughs> um, it was the truth. That's, thank you for asking, because I don't know that I've ever had that answer ready. Yeah. Um, Colleen, you, um, 
you know, have been in the industry for a while and have led the way so much for all women to have a voice um, and just recently put yourself um, literally in the firing line of the movement um, to make sure that a lot of the women here um, and even the men um, move forward in dignity and have a safe space um, and you know equity in the workplace. Um, beyond the amazing work that you've created, um, the seismic shifts in culture with the ads that you've created and now um, new president of Widening Kennedy. I don't know I if you guys know. caught that earlier. Thank you. Um, what do you hope your legacy will be? I also, I did not know this. <laughs> I was going to say that I could stand up here and not completely embarrass myself with you two. <laughs> but I'm not sure if I didn't. Um, honestly, I, I believe that it's um, you know, not just this industry, which is known for being incredibly cutthroat. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you add uh, uh, an environment where creativity, auteurism, becomes an excuse why only one makes it. Mm. Only adds an incredible mm -hmm. amount of pressure to who. Um, so I would really like my legacy to be that we finally understood that none of us make it till all of us make it. Um, mm. I think when you look at what creativity is doing now, when you look at Colin, and you look at that work, that's where creativity is going anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's. Well, doing this together. Yeah. yeah. Ladies, um, besides being fierce, amazing, prime examples of, you know, what love and of community is in real life, um, thank you so much for inspiring all of us. I hope that you guys heard all the jewels that were dropped. I mean, there's some, don't leave any on the floor, pick them on, all up on your way out. Um, but um, thank you for making us think and, you know, making us all want to take action and be you know, more like you in more ways than we can count. Um, thank you both and, you know, keep adding color to our industry. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you.